Good afternoon and welcome to today's planning committee. This is not a public meeting, but a meeting the public can attend. I'm Councillor Susan Durant, the Chair of Planning Committee. Before we commence, I'd like to outline the domestic arrangements for the meeting. We are not expecting a fire practice today. If the alarm sounds, please leave the building by way of the fire exit through the doors at the rear of the chamber on my right. When you have left the chamber, proceed down the stairway and exit through the emergency exit on the ground floor. If there is anybody with mobility issues, please wait in the refuge area at the top of the stairs where the emergency evacuation lift is located and use the intercom situated to the left-hand side of the lift doors to call for assistance. The designated assembly point is the public square in front of the cask beyond the fountain. I'd like to inform members of the public and press that today's meeting will be uh, audio-visually recorded and by entering the council chamber you accept that you will be recorded and your images retained and broadcast by the council on its website and on YouTube. If anyone intends to record or film any part of today's meeting, please ensure that this does not disturb the conduct of the meeting and you only focus on recording those people participating. Please ensure that your mobile phones are switched to silent mode. May I remind anyone speaking in the meeting that you will need to press the large red button underneath the microphone and ensure the light is illuminated and this will ensure that you are recorded. The meeting is proceeding today on the basis that all members of the committee have read their agenda papers thoroughly and are aware of what they will be considering today. If any members of the committee leave the chamber during consideration of an application, they should ensure that they do not take part in the vote on their return as they will not have heard all the relevant information on that particular item. Thank you. Item one on today's agenda are apologies for absence and we've received apologies from Councillor Amy Dixon and Andy Pickering. Are there any other apologies? Okay, item two, exclusion of press and public. There are no exempt items on today's agenda. However, legal advice which is exempt under paragraph five of schedule 12A of the Local Governments Act 1972 privileged information will need to be given on agenda item five number one application and therefore the committee will move into a private session for part of that agenda. Item three, are there any declarations of interest please? Uh, Councillor Sofilu? Yeah, I have a, a declared interest of application four because I'm the ward member. Thank you for that. Councillor Farmer? Yeah, I've got a declaration for application number five. I've got a family member speaking on this item. Thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Cox, did your hand go up then? Councillor Cox? Yeah, just to say that I, um, I'm going to listen to all of the information coming from item number one and not be predetermined. Thank you for that, Councillor Cox. Councillor Stapleton. Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> I've got two declarations to make. First of all, um, I've got an interest in item number five where I will be representing the Parish Council speaking in support of the application. And secondly, similar to my colleague to my left, um, I need to make a declaration, we have to make a declaration that with item number one, I will be dealing with only, my, any decision I make will be based on the, the information in front of me and anything that's said in the chamber today. Thank you for that. Item four is minutes of the planning committee mailed, me, sorry, my mouse dry today. Uh, minutes of the meeting uh, held on the 17th of October, 2023. Can the minutes be moved as a true and accurate record? Can we have that seconded? And is that agreed? Thank you. Item five, we're now moving on to the schedule of application. Application number one is planning application 23 oblique 01305 oblique 
4 FULM, which is the erection of a residential development with public open space and associated landscaping, drainage and infrastructure. This is the resubmission of application 2 to oblique 01710 uh, oblique F4 FULM, refused on the 14th of 4, 2023 at the land north of the railway line at Rosal. Um, this item, uh, we will need to exclude the public and press for part of the meeting. We will hear from the speakers and officers and then take a vote to move into private sessions with the committee. Um, Andrew so uh, so this is the planning case officer, will introduce this item. Thank you, Chair. Uh, there's quite a few pre-committee amendments, so I'm going to start off with those, I think. Um, there's a number of speakers for this application. We've got local ward councillors Nick Allen and Majid Khan, both speaking in opposition. The applicant and agent is speaking in support. We've got one speaker in opposition on behalf of local residents, the um, Rosal Residents Association. There's also going to be a number of consultees present to answer any technical questions. There's also technical consultants, um, such as ecology and highways, for the applicant who will be present to answer any questions that the committee might want to raise. Um, we've received three further representations which basically raises the same issues as, as already in the committee report, but there's one additional issue of illegal planting of 32 trees. There's also been a late representation uh, received on behalf of Rosehill Residents Association, raising issue with the officer recommendation report and the weighting that's been attached to the considerations of design, public open space, ecology, biodiversity, and tree issues within the planning, planning balance. In response to this, it is for the decision maker to attribute how much weight should be attached to each consideration as part of the overall planning balance. The representation also asserts that there was no assessment of the visual impact of the development. This site is allocated for housing. It's within a residential policy area and as part of its allocation went through a sustainability appraisal. The site is not an area of outstanding natural beauty, nor is it within Greenbelt, nor is it within the countryside. Therefore, there's no need for a visual impact appraisal. Moving on to amendments to the report, paragraph 8.55 is updated to reflect an error of the modelling of the nearby signalised junctions on the Bortry Road, Cantley Lane um, junction and the A638 Bortry Road adjacent St Augustine's Road. This was an issue, uh, this was due to a, a technical error with the software. This has been corrected and the model's been rerun. Uh, the traffic signals teams assess the modelling for this junction. It's currently operating slightly over absolute practical capacity during the morning peak hour. During the PM peaks, all arms of the junction operate within desirable practical capacity. Um, the bottom line is the performance of the junction will not be impacted during the AM peak, not in the um, PM peak, and this is due to the addition of traffic growth and committed development. The assessments carried out still confirms that the development will not result in a severe impact, but there will be a financial contribution of £2,000 for the junction to be revalidated, so it's £2,000 per signalised junction. Uh, paragraphs 8.97, 8.100 and 8.166 updates on the biodiversity net gain following up update of the DEFRA metric. So paragraph 8.97 updates on the DEFRA metric date, so that's now the 13th of November 2023. Paragraph 8.100 updates on the number of units and financial contributions. And paragraph 1.66 provides further details of the post-development habitat units and deficit. There's amended conditions 22 and 26. These are amended to reflect the updated reports as a result of the DEFRA metric update. So these are in reference to the report. So condition 22 as an updated report reference revised 13th of the 11th, 2023. And condition 26, um, again, updates on the Brooks Ecology Report. Um, so that's those two conditions. There's an, an additional 
condition 35. This is um, for details of the surfacing of the bridleways to be submitted and agreed. So that's all the pre-committee amendments. So looking at the application, it's a resubmission of an application previously refused by a committee on the 31st of March this year. It was a housing scheme for 121 houses on an allocated site at Rose Hill. There were three reasons for refusal. One being the traffic impacts on Borchie Road and Rose Hill Rise, both during the construction period and post-development. Two, loss of a non-designated open space. And three, loss of biodiversity and the adverse impact on wildlife, including protected species. This resubmission application addresses and overcomes the reasons for refusal. In relation to the first reason with the traffic impacts on Borchy Road and Rose Hill, there's been updated traffic surveys that have been done previously, further counts and modelling of the U-turn on Borchy Road. The traffic counts have been updated. They were carried out in May 2023, as opposed to those carried out in 2021. But the 2021 counts are higher. So these have been used again for robustness. Reason two cites the loss of a non-designated open space. And while it's acknowledged that this is a site which is a physical open space, when you read the local plan as a whole, it's allocated for development. So it isn't afforded protection under policy 27B so that seeks to preserve uh, open spaces. Non-designated open space is referred to in the policy justification at 10.16 in the subtext, and it's described as being incidental small areas of land within verges that are not significant enough to be separately identified. In other words, this site is too big to be considered as a non-designated open space. So obviously, as the officer advice for this reason for refusal is that it's untenable in this case and if members are minded to refuse this resubmission application, this reason shouldn't be included. And lastly, three, the um, loss of biodiversity and the adverse impact on wildlife. Ecology surveys have been undertaken in 20 and 21 and 22. These have been updated. So this includes further updated surveys for vegetation, bats, reptiles, badger and breeding birds. Ecological impacts have been reconsidered and the BNG, biodiversity net gain, has been updated. This was previously calculated using the DEFRA metric 3.1, whereas this resubmission uses the DEFRA metric 4. So the bottom line differences between the two metrics demonstrates a decrease of units to be secured off-site. So we've gone from 27.96 on the refuse scheme to 26.23 on this resubmission application and then a further reduction to 26.17 units with this uh, late amendment to the metric. So this resubmission application is fundamentally the same as the refused in that it still proposes 121 dwellings, public open space with associated infrastructure, landscaping and drainage. As you'll be aware, fully aware that the, the previous application was a contentious site. It still is a contentious site. It's again attracted a, a significant amount of public interest. Um, if you look at the slide and look at the slide, you can see the site adjoins the race course. There's two points of existing access to the site via Rosal Rise and the Avenue. There's the mineral, mineral railway line that runs southeast of the site. And to the northeast of the site is the Red House Plantation um, local wildlife site. And this shows, this aerial view shows a better view of the uh, overall picture of the site. I believe that most of you have already visited the site earlier this year, but this is a quick recap. So as you can see, these are the same photographs as previously. Nothing's changed um, when I visited most recently. So I've used the same photographs. They show the character of the site is mainly grassy scrubland. On the right is one of the bridleways running through the site and below is the row of oak trees along the edge of the race course on the boundary of the application site.
So in policy terms, the principle of residential development, nothing's changed since the previous application. The site's allocated for housing. The site's been allocated for housing for over 25 years. Firstly, in the Doncaster Unitary Development Plan, which was adopted in 1998. This has now been renewed as a housing allocation within the adopted Doncaster Local Plan. So as I mentioned previously, the application has again has received significant amount of public interest. So the objections are set out in paragraph 6.3 to 6.4 of the officer report, with the local ward council objections set out at paragraph 7.30 to 7.31. The main objections remain the same in relation to ecological concerns, such as loss of habitat species, loss of trees on site, impact on traffic, and loss of an open space. So these matters are all suitably addressed and resolved within the amended plans and submission of further details and reports. Further additional reports and surveys have been submitted with this application as detailed earlier. The application is fully compliant with all local plan policies. So the refuse scheme and this current scheme follows the design brief and developer requirements. Um, this sets out the main issues to consider for this site. The main issues being archaeological implications, biodiversity, design, education, public open space, transport, trees and hedgerows. This current application resubmission is fundamentally the same layout as the refuse scheme. As I've mentioned, it's again proposing 121 units. The application adheres to the design brief, takes access from the existing accesses on Rosal Rise and the Avenue. It provides a good buffer between houses and the adjacent race course. A number of trees are subject to TPO on and around the site. These have been fully considered and protected within the scheme. Existing bridleways are incorporated within the scheme, retaining the existing access to open spaces. And there's a full consideration of ecology and biodiversity. So as a quick comparison, this is the refuse scheme, and this is the resubmitted scheme. So you can see that nothing has fundamentally changed in terms of the layout. So what has changed with this resubmission? Well, there's slight amendment to the alignment of the bridleway to ensure the four metre width requirement along the main route, incorporating street trees, um, I think it might be easy if I just show you. Can I just show you on the slide to show you exactly where I'm talking about? So there's some of the house types have also changed and been updated. These are to comply with Partel of the building regs and there's also been um, an update to comply with the M42, M43 requirements um, as is required by policy 45. There's been a later amendment to the drainage um, which is to be installed. That will result in a number of trees to be lost. So if you look at paragraphs 8.134 of the, uh, the officer report, this covers this issue. And basically the tree officers commented that the routing avoids the best of the boundary trees, which is notably the TPO oaks, T21, 23, and 24. The tree officer has asked for confirmation of root breach for two of the trees uh, within the area. That's a poplar and a lime tree. And he's highlighted that these could be lost on account of root breach. Um, but the applicant has confirmed that these trees are on a different land level and on the opposite side of the ditch, so these won't be lost. They will definitely be retained. So subject to conditions, there's no objections from the tree officer. As you might recall from previously, there are archaeological implications on this site. There's Roman pottery remains within the northeastern sector, within the open space. South Yorkshire Archaeology has worked with the applicant and agreed the final scheme as they did previously. So the layout remains the same. 
It proposes a main loop road around the estate linking to Rosehill Rise and the avenue as per the design principles. The existing informal footpath routes, desire lines and connections have been incorporated into the layout so the site is easily accessible on foot and with connections to the wider area. This is again in accordance with the design principles. The Public Rights of Way Officer has requested the bridleways be retained at four metre width with surfacing to be agreed. Therefore, a condition is included for this. The layout follows the design brief by providing large detached dwellings along the racecourse boundary. Whilst they don't back directly onto the racecourse, they do back onto a green space, which is a landscape buffer between the development and the racecourse. This not only replicates but improves upon the existing landscape buffer along the backs of properties that already front on to Rosehill Rise and it provides a wider buffer zone than is there already on the backs of those properties. So this also ensures that no trees encroach into the rear gardens. As previously, the scheme proposes two, three, four and five bedroom, two storey detached and semi-detached houses with hipped roof and gable roof designs along with semi-detached single storey bungalows. The materials proposed reflect the character of the surrounding area, proposing red facing brick with terracotta or grey concrete roof tiles. Landscaping scheme will be agreed via condition, although a landscape master plan has been agreed in principle. The scheme proposes street tree planting within the grassed highway verges along the principal loop street and bridleways, planting to areas of public open space and planting to gardens. Objections being raised that the street trees will be planted illegally this is incorrect. The bridleway is the four metre requirement and has been amended to allow this and ensure this for street tree planting, which is a policy requirement under policy 48. In terms of open space, policy 28 sets a requirement for this site at 15% on site public open space provision. This scheme actually provides 34%, which is a significant amount that we do not normally see on planning applications and more than double the policy requirement. The public open space also creates a buffer between the woodland to the north and the proposed housing to the site. Uh, sorry, the housing to the south. This includes a large open space to the east of the site and smaller areas of open space within the estate adjacent to the Bridleway footpath, meaning there's a good spread on the site. So overall, the scheme meets local plan policies with respect to separation distances, therefore raising no amenity issues of overlooking or loss of light. The scheme provides off-street car parking for each dwelling. The application is in full accordance with local plan policies 41, 42 and 44 in terms of design, layout, access and highway requirements. And the council's urban design officer is supportive of the design and layout of the scheme. So just moving on to house types. Some house types have changed, as I mentioned pre previously, um, and they've been amended with this resubmission, so they comply with Part L of the building regulations. So this slide shows a five-bedroom detached house, which is the Greyford cottage style. This is one of the two executive house types that will back onto the race course. This slide shows an affordable two-bedroom bungalow. These are located in the northeast corner of the site, adjacent to the open space and backing onto the railway line. And this is the Briarwood village style, a four bedroom detached house. All house types meet nationally described space standards. Here's a couple of typical street scenes. Um, the top street scene is the executive homes that were back onto the race course. These are the more spacious open field between each dwelling and below are the houses within the wider estate. This is a, a CGI image of the executive homes that were back onto the race course. Uh, you can see that there's a, a tree lined road. Um, this is slightly out of date, that there will be more trees um, on the roadway. In the middle are the two houses, the Greyford house type that I showed you previously. This slide shows the current access an egress from the site. Um, construction access from Bortry Road to the site was previously raised by 
object objectors and again with this resubmission. Currently there's two-way access via Bawtree Road and Rosehill Rise and one-way access only via the avenue. The applicant is very much aware of residents' concerns in relation to the construction traffic and has agreed routing for construction vehicles with an agreed construction management plan. And briefly, the large vehicles and HGVs will enter and exit the site using Rose Hill Rise only. <coughs> Vans and cars will use the avenue to enter the site and exit via Rose Hill Rise. So the application attracts section 106 legal contributions as it did previously and running through them this includes provision of 23% affordable housing. I would just flag at this point that it's worth noting that Bessica Ward has the third highest need for affordable homes in the city with a potential need for 475 affordable homes as of June 2023. This site is only one of two sites allocated within the local plan, within the Bessica Ward, that would deliver any affordable housing. The other site is <coughs> at Lakeside. There will be provision of 34% on-site public open space, along with maintenance and a LEAP. This is over and above the 15% requirement. A total education contribution amounting to £481,752 towards the provision of 18 school places at Hall Cross Academy. There'll be a commuted sum of £17,529.27 pence as a transport bond in the event targets within the travel plan aren't met. There'll be an annual travel plan monitoring at a cost of £5,000 per entrance and ex exit point and traffic signals revalidation at two junctions um, at a, to a total cost of £4,000. Biodiversity net gain to deliver a minimum 10% net gain to be secured via a, a suitable off-site location or paying the council of a biodiversity offsetting contribution. Um, this is £27,500 per diversity unit needed. This is the cost. The cost per unit has increased from £25,000 since the refuse scheme. The late update to the DEFRA metric, as per the pre-committee amendments, approves upon the provision detailed in your report with an off-site deficit of 26.17 habitat units to deliver a net gain amounting to 719,675. Previously, there was a deficit of 26.23 habitat units delivering a minimum 10% gain, and this was amounting to £721,325. So there is a, a slight improvement with this very late amendment to the metric. So to summarise, um, this is an allocated housing site in the Doncaster local plan that will make a significant contribution to the council's five-year housing supply. <coughs> it will also provide for much needed affordable housing in the area. This, room is, this resubmitted application proposes 121 houses, same as that refused, which is a significantly lower density of development than the indicative 166 unit housing capacity within the local plan. This number was reduced very early in the pre-application stages in order to maximise the biodiversity interest and this was a key requirement of the council and has been responded to positively by the developer and it also helps to address local resident concerns. The scheme proposes the delivery of 34% on-site public open space, providing, providing more than double the usual policy requirement of 15%. The scheme proposes the full 23% or 28 units affordable housing requirement, therefore contributing to this much-needed housing within the area. The scheme will provide a well-designed, high-quality housing development, which will meet nationally described space standards. It also meets policy requirements for adaptable and accessible and wheelchair housing. Consultees have raised no objections on matters pertaining to ecology, trees, archaeology, highways, design, drainage matters or flood risk. The proposal is fully compliant with the development plan and therefore officer recommendation is for approval.
Thank you for that, Andrea. Uh, we now have Mr. Chris Owen on behalf of Rose Hill Residents Association, who has requested to speak in opposition of the application. This is now your opportunity to address the committee for up to five minutes. Uh, please press the large red button when you want to speak and press again to mute the microphone when you've concluded and I'll let you know when you've got one minute remaining. You can ask a procedural question, yes. Would you like to press the red button on your microphone? There's been um, some late amendments to the to the, to the agenda, including this change to the, um, the, the the traffic assessment to reflect an error in the modelling. W we told the council about this one and a half months ago, and this change is now on the very day of the meeting, just being put through, just being presented to us. So we've got had no time to review this model or to comment on it. Um, and this is in the context that I specifically asked Andrea earlier in the week. Are, is there any more, are there any more documents? Is there any more information that's coming through? And she said no. So I'd just like to point out, you know, this seems to me completely unfair and unacceptable to put through significant changes that the applicant and the council has been aware of for one and a half months on the very day of, of the council meeting. Uh, thank you for uh, the comment regarding uh, a procedural, um, but this is something that as a planning committee, we do have uh, amendments that are presented to us either on the day before even on the day of meetings and they are explained as well within the presentation as they have been done today so we are able to take on board the content um, of those amendments but I thank you for that and if you'd like to start your presentation thank you You're being asked to approve an application you've already refused, even though there's been no changes which support a different decision. The traffic assessments are still significantly flawed. This so-called technical error, i.e. a figure of 100% changed to 0% during between various models, is not a technical can I error. Told that? Can somebody whose phones is, can we please make sure your phones are on silent, please? If you'd like to start again, Mr. Owen, apologies for the interruption. There are also many other issues with the assessments, such as modelling a queue of just three cars at the racecourse roundabout at rush hour. Construction will make... Oh, Construction will make living in and around Rose Hill a nightmare. At least 40 journeys a day from construction traffic, worker traffic, plus another 30 from HGVs, which is shown in the slide, block both lanes of Bawtry Road entering and exiting Rose Hill and will obstruct our narrow estate roads in trying to get to and from the site. Highway safety issues, noise, dust, queues, delays, accidents, one of Doncaster's busiest roads and a quiet housing estate turned into a construction site for around 11 hours on weekdays and six on Saturday for years. Their traffic assessments do not properly assess the impact of this scheme. Next slide. On ecology, nothing has changed. Yorkshire Wildlife Trust objects to these plans again, saying there's nothing to change the reason for refusal. The plans still cause a massive 59% biodiversity loss, showing little attempt has been made to mitigate the devastating impact this scheme has on nature and wildlife. The plans harm protected and endangered species and cause significant loss of habitat in what the Trust says is an important site in an ecological network in an ecologically sensitive location. You should again refuse these environmentally destructive plans. The impact on trees and woodland is shocking. The local plans say schemes must avoid 
loss of woodland and tree loss which adversely affects public amenity or ecological interest. The preconceived design of this scheme ignores the tree survey which says every tree has value and as many as possible should be retained and bulldozes all trees and woodland in its path, destroying ecological interest and all public amenity of this much loved and much used green space. Next slide. Last time, they wrongly claimed only 115 trees would be lost. Now, no numbers given. Neither they nor officers want you to know that hundreds of trees, including one hectare of woodland, will be destroyed under these plans. And they don't even try to replace them, just 80 for the hundreds removed. Officers say the trees lost are of low value. Not true. As shown in the slide, the tree survey says most are valuable category B trees in well-established woodland groups which guidance says should be retained and which the tree survey says councils normally resist being removed. Not this council though. The officers either don't know or don't care about the number or value of trees being destroyed should give you serious concerns about the approach they've taken to this application. National Woodland Charity Reforest Britain has objected to these plans because they're appalled by their devastating impact on trees and woodland. You also should be appalled and refuse this submission. And on drainage, surface water from 121 houses is to flow into a ditch covered in vegetation with fallen trees in places. Can it handle the runoff? Who will maintain it? Could the race course flood? No one seems to know or care. Next. Nothing is different from last time to make you change your decision. And yet, you've been asked to overturn a democratic vote refusing planning permission to let them build the same scheme on land the council has a vested interest in. How would that look? What message would that send? If they think you've got it wrong, the remedy's through appeal, not resubmitting the same thing again to try and force you into changing your mind. Local authorities must remaining. have the trust of those they represent. Please, therefore, send a message that people can trust that when this committee says no, it means no. Yorkshire Wildlife Trust, South Yorkshire Climate Alliance, Reforest Britain, Yorkshire Rewilding Network, Doncaster Naturalist Society, all three ward councillors, Doncaster residents, all oppose these plans. Building on Rose Hill will destroy an important site in an ecological network, green space, trees, woodland and biodiverse habitat during a climate and biodiversity emergency. It will turn a quiet neighbourhood and one of Doncaster's busiest roads into a construction site for years. It will make traffic worse. It will ruin the lives of people in the area. This council has promised to avoid loss of green space, to protect biodiversity, trees and woodland, to create greener communities. We ask this committee to once again honour those promises. Please refuse this resubmission and save Rose Hill. Thank you, Mr. Thank Owen. you. Thank you very much. Committee members, do we have any questions for Mr. Owen? No? Thank you for your submission. We now have Councillor Nick Allen, Ward Member, who has requested to speak in opposition to the application. It's now your opportunity to address the committee for up to five minutes. Please press the large red button when you're ready to speak and then again to mute your microphone when you've concluded and I'll let you know when you've got one minute remaining. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm very disappointed to have to be here again. Um, it seems those eight months, it took us uh, a long time to get to planning committee last time. You made a great decision, you made a great choice, and now we've gone down this route, unfortunately, and it seems it's an unprecedented one, uh, to have a special extraordinary meeting for an application, to have it refused, to have the applicant then appeal that decision and then resubmit. I think you'll find in our local history, in our at least 20 years, it is unprecedented for us to go down that route in quite that way. Uh, but I rest assured, of course, having known now what I know, if the, uh, this application is refused, we'll see you all again in six months' time or something, because frankly, if that's the way you go about things, you just, um, you know, you send a message to the public that your decision-making powers are effectively open to being curtailed uh, whenever you don't make a decision that an applicant uh, agrees with, and that is not what we're there to do. This application is not substantially different from the one we saw in March. It is not going to affect or change any of the problems I highlighted when I spoke here in March about access to Rose Hill 
and the site going down the avenue <laughs> is going to cause huge problems for local residents, not least with noise, but also with the amount of uh, the tonnage going down there and back up could really damage that road. It is not a suitable layout for es essentially creating an extra cul-de-sac, if you like, on the end. Uh, it isn't a suitable site. I know that this has been spoken about many, many times, but really um, that problem needs to be, be understood because the, the problems you're going to create on Cantley Lane, Bawtry Road, you know, there's already pre-existing problems there, but those things are going to be exacerbated. The fact is it takes a very long time to get out of, onto Bawtry Road at the best of times, certainly in the morning. With this estate, it will only increase that problem. And that's a very real problem in, you know, a part that's very close to central Doncaster, very close to Bellevue, very close to the Dome. It's going to, you know, r really affect local people's lives, and and it's it's just not on that. Um, after having uh, said that eight months ago, I'm having to come back here to repeat myself in this way, because a developer has uh, decided to play the system in this way. Um, I don't think of anything really to add. I think in many ways this type of, um, I'll say it's a procedure, but really it isn't a procedure. The fact that we're here again indicates that actually one of the uh, fundamental roles of a good ward councillor, that is to represent his residents or their residents, is, uh, is being challenged effectively here today in a wholly undemocratic way, in a very unjust way, because effectively your hands have been tied behind your back. Every time you don't make the right decision, are you going to be, um, you know, have our own procedures for applying? Are they going to be exacerbated and exacerbated until they're totally exhausted until you get you know, a decision that a developer can agree with. And that's absolutely farcical, quite frankly. And I know it might well be within the rules, but there's being within the rules, and then there's being within sort of some sort of moral parameters for how to go about business. And this quite clearly isn't right. You know, there are plenty of other sites around <coughs> Doncaster which are more suitable for development, and this is not one of them. Not least with this application, it isn't substantially different. There are going to be huge problems, not least as Chris has just identified in relation to uh, the ecological agenda. But the fact is, it, it, it's not a suitable site. It's a loss of amenity. It's a, a site that isn't accessible, and it is used mainly for dog walking. It's uh, used by elderly residents who don't really have anywhere One else to go. Thank you, Chair. Elderly residents who don't really have anywhere else to go. Um, you're effectively pr um, depriving them a, a small sort of isolated community, you're depriving them of, you know, their only item of green space. And uh, although it is included in the local plan, that itself was very contentious. This has been an incredibly contentious uh, issue since it started six, almost seven years ago. And, you know, this isn't going to make it any better. So I'd ask you, you know, use your judgment. In fact, actually, what I would request is that given the unprecedented nature of this type of application, can we do a site visit? Because there are new members of the committee compared to the one we had in March. And that actually, if you could consider doing a site visit so that you can acquaint yourself with it, I think that would really, really help. That's it. Thank you for that. Do we have any questions to Councillor McCallum? No? Okay, we've now got Council Madhu Khan, ward member, has requested to speak in opposition to this application. It's now your opportunity to address the committee for up to five minutes. If you'd like to press the red button when you're ready to start your submission and press it again to mute the microphone when you're concluded and I'll let you know when you've got one minute remaining. Chair, again, thank you very much for allowing me to speak. Thank you, colleagues on the planning committee, and thank you, fellow officers. I know this has been a long process and many man hours have gone into this, but I'm really disappointed that we're back here at planning committee and that the residents of Doncaster are having to defend a decision which was correctly made at the planning committee democratically last time around. Outsiders looking in on this may view the approach which has been taken by Miller Holmes as being quite unorthodox in that after the correct decision was made by our planning committee last time, 
an appeal was lodged with the National Planning Inspectorate and simultaneously another planning application has been submitted. And again, as outsiders looking in, who often do outside of the chamber, the residents of Doncaster, they may view this as an attempt of bullying by Miller Homes in that if the correct decision isn't taken by the planning committee, the correct decision that they view it to be, then we'll be taken to the planning inspector and here's your chance planning committee to change that decision that you've correctly made. That's how the residents of Doncaster will be viewing the tactics which have been employed by Miller Homes. I mirror what Councillor Allen has just said in around a site visit for newer members onto the committee. Bawtry Road, Cantley Lane, backing up all the way to Bellevue in towards intake between half past seven and half past nine in the morning is absolutely atrocious for traffic. I live there myself, I know what it's like. And with site traffic entering and exiting the site, it's going to be gridlocked and traffic jam for the foreseeable future. At a time when we've called for a climate emergency and we're doing our bit to restore the damage which our planet has sustained, we're going to be adding to that by destroying a fantastic piece of woodland that we've got here in Doncaster and forcing more traffic onto those narrow estate roads and making the situation for residents absolutely unbearable. There's one of the things which I struggle to understand is the road layout and I know officers are referring to it as there's going to be two different site entrances and exits for heavy HEV traffic and smaller vans but on the avenue my understanding again I live in the ward and I've, I walk around there with my kids often that's a one-way street so how are vans going to be exiting or entering onto there when there's only one-way access I still I've never been able to understand that and alongside that how are HEV lorries going to be able to navigate along Bawtry Road make the left hand turn onto a narrow estate road without blocking up traffic for miles in either direction. The U-turn at the Shell petrol station, for those of you who live in that side of town, understand how congested that can become. How will traffic navigate around there at half past eight in the morning? It will become almost impossible to do. Alongside that, as the Rose Hill residents and Chris as their spokesman have brightly highlighted the amount of trees which are going to be destroyed i don't think it's truly reflected in the way miller homes project what they're planning on doing there and it would be imperative for committee members to go on site go there at eight o'clock in the morning and you'll fully understand how difficult a site this is to develop how it's almost impossible unless there's a flyover built which is going to allow for traffic to navigate in and out of the site and to see yourself the impact that it's going to have on amenities in the locality, on wildlife and on animals which live in the area. One of the points which I raised last time was around Yorkshire water and I know representations have been sent to our MP as well around that, around flooding on Rose Hill and I was told at the, t at the time that it's an oper operational issue to, uh, it's an operational issue that will be dealt with when, uh, thank you chair, as and when the site becomes operational. But the last thing that we want for new residents who potentially could be living there is to be floating in, in sewage water because of uh, inadequate sewerage on the site. Committee, be brave and be bold and stick with the correct decision that you've already taken. The approach taken by Miller Homes to the outsiders, people outside of the committee, residents of Doncaster will see this as bullying by a developer to get their way. You've already made the right decision once. Please stick with that decision and make it again. Thank you. Thank you for your submission, Councillor Pound. Do any committee members wish to ask Councillor Pound a question? No? Thank you. We now have uh, Miss Emma Lancaster from Quad, the agent, and Mr Ian Thompson from Miller Holmes, the applicant, who have requested to speak in support of the application. Are you sat over there? Which ones are you? Right, okay, I'll sit aside, thank you. Uh, this is now your opportunity for up to five minutes collectively uh, to address the committee. Please press the red button when you want to speak and press again to mute the microphone when you've completed your submission. Uh, once you've concluded your submission, um, we do have technical officer in attendance if members have any questions as well, and I will let you know when you've got one, one minute remaining. 
Thank you, Chair. The starting point for the determination of this application is that there is a plan-led presumption in favour of the development, and your professional officers have told you that there are no material considerations to justify a decision which is not in accordance with your development plan. In the circumstances, the resubmission is not an unusual one, and this application provides committee with the chance to keep control of how the development is delivered and avoid the costs of defending an appeal. We commend local residents for engaging with the submission in the way that they have, but we are conscious that the submission is very technical and detailed in nature, and we don't want members to be confused or misled on very complex matters. We'd urge you to please ask questions, if not of our technical team here today, but of your own professional officers. It's suggested by objectors that nothing has changed to warrant a different decision this time, but this is not true. On transport, we've undertaken new surveys and undertaken a more detailed consideration of the construction phase impacts. All of the, these conclude that there are no severe transport impacts that would warrant refusal. On ecology, there are new surveys also, and we have reconsidered the approach to on-site mitigation. This has resulted in greater levels of habitat retention and enhancement, including the translocation of acid grassland. We achieve a 10% biodiversity net gain in accordance with policy, and there is nothing to prevent the habitat trading rules being met. Through amendments to our design and layout, we've also secured betterment through this application, including the improved treatment of retained public rights of way and provision of a kickabout area as part of the public open space. Finally, residents are concerned about tree loss, but we have followed British standards in terms of our assessment most trees that are lost are self-seeded and not mature. They are only classed as category B because they are part of a group. The most important trees are kept and officers are not concerned in this regard. Throughout the application process, you've heard our views on the suitability of a planning consent being granted, as well as the representations of local residents. However, as is often the case in this process, the people you haven't heard from are those who would benefit the most from it coming forward. Regionally and nationally, we are facing an undersupply of housing, with some groups referring to a housing emergency and citing this as a contributing factor to the wider cost of living crisis. There are very many inhabitants of this authority who will not be aware of this scheme, but would directly benefit from the site being delivered. In particular, Doncaster's strategic housing team advise that for every affordable dwelling completed in the authority earlier this year, there was an average of 90 bids from individuals or families wishing to get a home of their own with one three-bedroom house in Cantley drawing 297 applications for a chance to live there. There are over 450 households in the Cantley and Bessick Award on the housing waiting list who, on a means-tested basis, could bid on the affordable dwellings proposed on this scheme, including six wheelchair-accessible bungalows. We are fully committed to meeting all policy requirements for the various mitigations needed to accommodate this development. We fully accept our obligations to make the necessary contributions towards education, highways, biodiversity and affordable housing. It is undeniable that this scheme will create a level of disruption, as does any other. However, we are seeking to invest in the area in a responsible manner. We have met with, with residents and ward members during this process. We acknowledge their concerns around the change that this development would bring, but we have assured them that we are committed to working within the rules laid out and that we have employees and contractors who are helpful and respectful in their approach. We take our responsibilities seriously and know that we would be held accountable by our neighbours, customers and ward councillors should this scheme proceed. Objections from the local residents group cannot be overlooked and their engagement with the planning team and council has One made material change. The proposal has evolved significantly since submitted in 2021. Large areas of green space have been worked back into the scheme and the housing numbers are now 45 less than the indicative capacity. We've also satisfied the professionally qualified officers in the council's various departments to the extent that they are willing to pre present this scheme with a recommendation to grant consent. We would respectfully ask the committee members to take a balanced view in also coming to their own decision. Thank you. Thank you for your submission. Do we have any questions that we'd like to ask? Councillor Cox? Thank you. It's, it's a simple question, really. Is if if the previous application had gone through, obviously you've made quite a few amendments in here. Would you have done them anyway, or would we just stop with what was obviously wrong in the first application? I think it's 
it's likely we would have proceeded with with an approval at that point in time. So you can say that there has been some some change here. Do we have any other questions? No. Thank you for your submission. We will now vote to exclude press and public in accordance with paragraph five of part one of schedule 12A of the local government act 1972. Is that moved? Moved. Is that seconded? And is that agreed? We'll do it by show of hands. So those four. Okay. Thank you. Committee. Uh, committee members, what we're going to do is there's a, a part of this agenda now that um, is private and it means instead of asking you all to leave the chamber, we're going to take the committee members out. It's going to be for approximately 10 to 15 minutes and then we will come back in and go into a debate section of the agenda. So please bear with us. Good afternoon. Thank you everybody for uh, bearing with us while we had to have a private session. Uh, committee members, we're now going to continue the meeting and we're going to go into the debate session. Does any member wish to comment on the report and ask the planning case officer a question? Therefore, is there a proposal to grant planning permission subject to conditions and the signing of a section 106 agreement is there a mover for the recommendation, please? I will move the recommendation. Is there a seconder for the recommendation? That's been seconded. Can we have a show of hands, those in favour of the recommendation, please? Can you just put your hands up fully, please, so it can be seen? Those against? Abstentions. Therefore, the application has been successful and planning permission granted. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're now going to go into a 10 minute break and we will resume back at 15.30. Thank you. Okay, thank you, everybody. We're now up to application number two which is planning application 22 oblique 00848 oblique FUL, which is the erection of 38 residential units and 56 retirement living homes, including the landscaping and access at land on the north east side of Sanford Road in Balby. And this is Mel Robert, who is the planning case officer that will introduce this item. Thank you, Chair. Um, just to go through the pre-committee amendments, it's just to set out the speakers there. Um, but just to let you know that Asad Hamad of Housing 21 has been un unable to make it. So uh, the speakers are Kat Crisp, who's the planning agent, and Andrea Brough of Together Housing. So uh, members will recall that this application was considered recently at the September committee and was deferred for further publicity to make it clear that the apartments and the bungalows are retirement living rather than extra care. So the application description has been amended and we've carried out further publicity, uh, both in the press, on site, and with letters sent to all neighboring properties. We've had one additional letter um, that have, that's raised similar concerns to those that were raised previously. So I just really wanna quickly take you through um, same slides as last time just to jog your memory more than anything um, so this is an application for the erection of 38 houses and 56 retirement living homes totaling 94 dwellings so the 38 houses are in the eastern half of the site you can see from that site plan and in the western half are the retirement living homes comprising 13 bungalows and 43 apartments that are in a three-story building you can see there at the bottom of the site plan. The proposal is for 100% affordable housing across the site. The site. Access is into the site from Sunningdale Road, which you can see there at the very bottom of the plan, with pedestrian access also from Cross Bank. 
which is on the you can see that coming in from the the western side the scheme provides for open space within the southeast corner of the site and also around the southern edge and also through the center and a landscape garden is provided for the apartments the number of dwellings in the proposed layout has significantly changed since the original submission mainly due to the constraints that are on the site these constraints include a standoff distance from the wastewater facility to the south, power lines that run through the centre of the site, and also the need for a standoff distance from the watercourse that runs along the southern edge of the site. So the original submission was for the erection of 76 dwellings and 43 retirement living apartments, making a total of 119, and the current scheme is for 25 less dwellings than originally applied for. So quickly, just to take you through the uh, photos, this is an aerial photograph, uh, just picking out there, you can see the application site, and directly to the north, we have a, an application in currently for 65 affordable dwellings, and this is uh, currently under consideration. So just to take you through the surrounding land uses, starting from the top, we've got the existing uh, open space there, and working eastwards you've got the um, residential properties of Coronation Road and next to that you've got that application in for the housing and to the north of that you can see the industrial development there to the east is, is open land to the south you can see the wastewater treatment works there at the very bottom working what to the left then you've got allotments and then to the left of that is a residential mobile home park site and then working up beyond that is a children's nursery directly to the west of the site and just to the left of that is, is Lidl. So these are some photos. This is where the access will come into the site from Sunningdale Road. You can see the rear of the properties on Coronation Road there on the left hand side. This is looking towards the southern end of the site. I don't know if you can just about make out in the distance there the residential park home site. I think you can just about make out the roofs there and also the wastewater treatment works. And you can also see the power line there running across the site from east to west. This is looking towards the eastern end of the site. And just to note there, there is an issue of fly tipping on the site. And this is the existing track that runs along the back of the properties on Coronation Road. And again, there's also evidence of fly tipping down there, which is, on my latest visit, was even worse than that. Um, so just to take you through some planning issues, in principle, the site is allocated for housing within the local plan. and is therefore acceptable in principle. The site is in a sustainable location with a range of facilities and services within walking distance of the site. That plan shows the bus stops which are fairly close to the site on Sanford Road and Balby Road. Just to take you through the house types, this is some typical street scenes showing the, the, the housing, all sort of two storey. Those are the retirement live-in bungalows and the floor plan of those bungalows. These, these are the three storey apartments and the ground floor plan of the apartments where there is an office for a local housing manager who will be there to support residents. There's a communal lounge and then also an area for storing mobility scooters. So again, without going through all the issues in the report, you can see that all issues have been resolved, including highways, drainage, maintaining adequate separation distance from existing residential properties surrounding the site. There would be a requirement for a Section 106 agreement if this were granted, and that would secure 100% affordable housing, a small contribution to re revalidate the signals, and also a returnable travel bond. The proposal is part grant funded by Homes England, and the applicant has submitted a viability assessment to show that it would not be viable to make a contribution to meet 10% biodiversity net gain. In conclusion, the site is allocated for housing in the local plan, is in a sustainable location and will provide much needed affordable housing of the type that is required. It's therefore recommended that planning permission be granted subject to a section 106 agreement and the conditions set out in the report. Thank you for that, Mel. 
We've now got Miss Kat Chris, the agent, and Miss Andrea Zuff of Together Housing was requested to speak in support of the application. This is now your opportunity to address the committee for up to five minutes collectively. Please press the large red button when you're ready to start your submission and press again to mute your microphone when you've finished and I'll let you know when you've got one minute remaining. Hello, thank you for giving Together Housing the opportunity to speak in favour of the application today. Together Housing and Housing 21 both have a long established relationship with Doncaster Council and we've been developing and providing affordable house, housing for Doncaster people for many, many years now. We successfully manage a large number of homes within the Doncaster area and we are both committed to a long-term presence here. We both allocate our new homes through Doncaster's letting system where homes are offered to people who are registered with the council and are recognised as being in need. We will work with the council to ensure that the most suitable lettings policy is adopted for this scheme and we are very experienced in finding that right solution, whether that be for general lettings or for lettings based on local connections through a local lettings policy. <coughs> These new modern family homes, retirement living apartments and bungalows will provide a standard of accommodation that allows Doncaster families to live in well insulated, warm and efficient homes that are free from gas in a range of much needed accommodation types. Our scheme is to be delivered as part of Together Housing's strategic partnership with Homes England using affordable housing grant to supplement Together Housing's loan facilities for new build homes. Homes England are fully supportive of this scheme and we have allocated significant levels of grant from our programme to ensure it can be delivered. This will add to our ongoing level, uh, long going development commitments in Doncaster and further support the millions of pounds of Homes England grant and our own internal funds that we have chosen to direct to the Doncaster area. Thanks. Good afternoon, councillors. I'm here today to present the key points in support of the proposed development that's for 38 residential units and 56 retirement living homes on this allocated housing site. The site is designated for housing in the local plan, establishing its acceptability in principle. Sustainably located, the site is easily accessible to various amenities, including a little supermarket and several schools. Employment opportunities are also within walking distance, promoting accessibility and convenience for future residents. Aligned with national planning policy, the development prioritises sustainable development, balancing the social, environmental and economic aspects of the scheme. The social sustainability is addressed through the careful design considerations to minimise impact on residential amenity, ensuring appropriate separation distances and implementing a construction management plan to mitigate potential further disturbances during construction. The design of this site follows 16 months of discussions and negotiations working closely with your officers and takes into account the environmental constraints including the wastewater facility, overhead power lines and easements to the watercourse. The layout features varied building heights, green corridors and crime prevention measures. Open spaces across the site exceed the policy requirements and provide a comprehensive and a comprehensive ecological assessment informs plans for the habitat enhancements and biodiversity gains. A detailed tree survey and arboricultural impact assessment guide the preservation of important existing trees and the introduction of soft landscaping across the site. The proposed tree to plot ratio and street trees align with policy standards contributing to the overall aesthetic and quality of the development. The landscaping helps to integrate and assimilate this scheme into the surrounding landscape. A thorough transport assessment demonstrates minimal impact on local traffic, emphasising the well-connected nature of the site with its footways, cycle paths and public transport options. Traffic calming measures, comprehensive pedestrian remaining. access and adequate parking provision including EV charging points are all proposed. A flood risk assessment and air quality assessment support the development and have been agreed with the councillors' consultees subject to the appropriate conditions. 
a commitment to energy efficiency aligns with Part L building regulations reflecting the forward-thinking approach to reduce carbon emissions over the development's lifetime. The proposed development not only provides much-needed affordable housing, but also stimulates the local economy through job creation and supply chain engagement. In conclusion, the proposed development aligns with the site's allocation in the local plan, prioritises sustainability and addresses key considerations such as amenity, ecology and economic impact. The viability assessment justifies the inability to achieve the 10% biodiversity net gain, but with the proposal providing substantial benefits in affordable housing. The overall planning balance supports the Apologies development for fulfilling... That's your time, I'm afraid. Okay. So that's your five minutes. Uh, we're going to go to questions from the committee. Are there any questions the committee would like to ask? <coughs> Councillor Cox. I just want to know what, what do you deem <coughs> affordable is? What is affordable? Affordable housing is as defined with the government defined within the Affordable Housing Act. Now, for us, um, we would look at that based on the 80% of affordable of market rent. But actually, in reality, sometimes what we do look at is um, an amount that's based on our neighbourhoods team's advice. So if they feel that actually it's not achievable in that area and actually people who need housing there can only afford the local housing allowance we'll look at how we do that but actually it's always assessed on 80 percent of uh, market rent as the guidelines say from the government council beach thank you um On your on your on the presentation, you have we have here that there are is storage for um, area, area for scooters. Now I believe on the last time it was before us, uh, Councillor Stapleton asked about that, and it has been included. But I'm asking, is there any car parking for the um, you know the the, the apartments? Because um, it's for people who are only 55. I mean, they're probably driving for many years, and I can't see. Drawing is a bit small and I can't actually see any sort of little spaces. <laughs> yeah, there is car parking for the apartments. Um, it's sort of within the L shape itself, just to the sort of western side of the apartments. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's a mixture of disabled and M43 compliant and M42, so they're accessible spaces and disabled spaces. Do we have any other questions? No? Okay, thank you, everybody. Uh, right, we're going to go into debate now. Does any member wish to ask the case officer any questions? No? Okay. Is there a proposal to grant planning permission subject to the signing of a Section 106 agreement? I think Councillor Staples can actually beat me to that one. <laughs> so, <laughs> is there a seconder? <laughs> Councillor Beach, is there a seconder? Second, thank you. Can we first show of hands of those in favour of accepting the application? Those against? Any abstentions? Councillor Hogarth? Are you in support? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, therefore, planning permission has been granted. We'll just let the uh, planning case officers swap seats. Application number three is planning application 22 of Leap 01032 of Leap FULM, which is the erection of building with commercial units at ground floor level and office space at upper levels, use class E, with landscaping, 
creation of car park area and associated work at Hurton Way in Doncaster. And Jess Duffield is the planning case officer that will introduce this item. Thank you, Chair. This application is for a proposed four-storey mixed-use building consisting of office at the, at the upper floors and small-scale small scale commercial units at the ground floor. During this application, the, applica uh, the applicant has worked closely with consultees, particularly in regards to design, as well as ensuring strict accordance with the relevant policies in terms of this out-of-centre location. A retail slash policy sequential test has been provided and it therefore justifies the position of this proposal. The application has been presented today due to public interest with a total of 24 reps being uh, submitted, which are summarised at section 6 of the planning committee report. The proposal is recommended for approval subject to the signing sec of the section 106 agreement <coughs> and the agent is going to speak in support of the application today. So the site's located in a mixed-use area in Lakeside and is surrounded by a mixture of uh, different uses. And it sits, it's the land, as you could just see outlined in red there, sits on the end of uh, the established row of leisure uses. The leisure park's been there for many years and was extended further to the north, creating what's known as the Hurton Triangle development in circa 2019. The Dome Leisure Park, sorry, the Dome Leisure Centre sits just, I highlight it there in sort of the blue, but that's actually the car park. Um, just to the northeast of the site and the Asda supermarket slightly further to the north. So I've just highlighted in there sort of the mixed, tried to sort of show the mixture of uses. So the blue sort of shows the, the leisure um, uses there with the orange highlighting the nearby <coughs> residential development. So right to the immediate south of the site is the sort of newer residential development you can see there and then the older residential development on the other side of the road. just wanted to show some of the surrounding site characteristics. So multi-storey buildings um, are not unusual in this location with the Premier Inn Hotel immediately to the side and then the Cheswell Pub, Pizza Express and View Cinema um, there as well as those apartments on the other side. As you can see there are a mixture of materials there, primarily brick but also some um, examples of render. And again, just showing here as well, um, the newer style housing development has a slightly more contemporary feel with the use of render and dark window frames, as well as those sort of newer restaurants at Hurton Way having clad in and dark brick features as well. And again here, just another image of the site in relation to the surrounding um, development. As you can see along the pedestrian footpath in front of those leisure uses, there's um, sort of a tree-lined footpath and as well as trees within the car park as well, whereas the housing development sort of to the south of the site, if we shift to the north in that picture, um, has a bit more high density with less trees. But um, I think it's really clear along that row of leisure uses, there's quite a lot of grass in between the buildings as well, surrounding each of the leisure uses. So quite large buildings with sort of larger footprints, but grass and landscaping in between, just to give it that green and spacious feel. And then this is the site itself. It's a relatively flat site, um, which is open. It's it's not enclosed to the north or south, and is, is no has has never really had any formal use apart from being a bit of a cut through from the car park to the lakeside walk. Again, here just showing. So there are trees down, trees and hedgerow down the um, eastern side of the site. But as you can see in that bottom picture, unfortunately, the hedgerow has already been cut through in some places as people just walking through it. The site has a quite a few, um, like I said, there's more established trees to the north along the footpath with lower quality trees along the side, which unfortunately, quite a few of them um, have already have a disease called bacterial canker. And I'll touch on that in a little bit later as well. So this is the proposal, the CGI of what the proposal will look like here. So as you can see, it's a four-storey building with those sort of um, commercial uses at the ground floor. And here is the site plan as well. So um, the building has quite a modern appearance, but still considered to be relatively traditional in keeping with those surrounding characteristics. There's new footpath links into those established footpaths already. Um, and an area of public open space to the south, which will provide an extra sort of buffer in between the residential houses to the uh, to the south. 
There's a slight service area, so originally the proposal did include some residential, but that's been lost through the evolution of the application, but that sort of access off that southern road has been retained as, as sort of for use for deliveries and as well as just a little bit of on-site parking for staff. So I'll just flick through the floor plans relatively quickly. So at the ground floor, you've got those three commercial units, which are also described as ancillary retail based on the size of them. Um, condition 21 protects those ground floor units from being merged into one or reconfigurated. So they must remain like that un unless they come in with a separate planning application. As you can see, there's quite a few doors at the ground floor to help encourage that active street frontage and encourage people to come into the development as well as well as those two um, entrance lobbies up to the upper floors. And then this is an um, example layout of the office space. So this is of the first floor, but all of them are relatively similar. So the office space is aimed at sort of startup style businesses, hence the sort of combination of smaller units rather than one large office space, as well as some sh shared breakout and communal areas and a balcony on the southern elevation. As mentioned, like I said, the second and third floor are relatively the same. They've just sort of kept that a bit more open so you can see the size of those rooms a bit easier. And on the roof level, we've got um, solar panels covering about a half, half to two thirds of the, of the roof, as well as a roof terrace area, which is associated with the office space. The exact design and sort of the furniture that will be put on that roof terrace is uh, subject to a condition. And again, just picking up on the elevation, so you, they've used these two tone type of brickwork to help break up the massing and the, um, create a bit more interest along what is a relatively large building, but as mentioned, that's it, it's not on un, a characteristic of that area. There's also these two different eaves heights as, get as well, just to help break it up. I'm just picking through those, so that's it to the north and to the south as well. And to that side, this is the elevation which should be mostly um, out of view and next to the, the side elevation of the Premier Inn Hotel. And again, they're just sort of showing the massing of it in combination with those surrounding, surrounding buildings. So in terms of the policy allocation of the site, the site is within the Dome Leisure Park out of centre location, which directly relates to policy 22. Typically, um, applications or proposals within these areas are assessed against Part 3. So as you can see, Part 3C relates to small-scale um, ancillary uses, which the retail element is um, considered to fall within, but the office element was, um, does not fall within those, that criteria, so therefore was assessed, assessed against Part 1. Oh, is it clicking through to that? Which refers to the sequential approach. So a sequential test in regards to the office development has been provided and assessed by um, my colleagues in planning policy. A lot of the representations submitted were regards to residential amenity in terms of the size of the building and its impact upon sort of overshadowing overlooking of those existing houses. So like I said, through the application that's set out in section six, the, uh, the proposal has been reduced sort of a couple of story heights removed and slightly recited as well to address those concerns. And this final scheme being presented today significantly exceeds the separation distances required by the SPD guidance. So as you can see there, there's over 40 metres um, to the house to the south and over 39 metres to the houses to the other side of the road. So not considered to be any p impact in regards to overlooking. And again, a lot of the other representations were in regards to the impact upon um, the highways and car parking. So the proposal will utilise the existing, sort of known as the view car park, but sort of serves the whole leisure park. Um, they provided, the applicants provided capacity tests as junction surveys as well to assess the, the wider impact upon the highway network, which have been assessed by our colleagues in highways. And there's no objections in regards to that. And just for a sort of a visual representation as well, I've just taken some screenshots of the um, car park sort of through time to again show that particularly during daytime hours, you can visually see it's quite a lot of capacity in that car park. And again, just flicking to one prior to 2017 as well before the pandemic as well, you can see it's still relatively empty. However, just to ensure that sustainable transport is included within development, as you can see, there's quite a few bus stops. Lakeside is um, well serviced by bus stops. It's particularly um, Bortry Road to the north is just sort of a less than a 10 minute walk from the site. Uh, so good connections in regards to that. Uh, on site, we've also got some EV charging spaces of those on site space, those spaces that are provided and um, cycle storage as well. 
Um, touching on trees again, so as mentioned, those sort of lower quality trees down the side, elevation of the site, some of those will be removed, but as, as picked out in that tree survey there, as you can see, some of them already so signs of disease, so unfortunately would not uh, sort of categorise as low quality and would not survive much longer anyway. Um, however, like I said, you can see we've got new planting on site along the other elevation and the larger trees will be retained as well as sort of other landscaping. Um, there's no landscaping conditions attached to the permission because the tree officer is satisfied with all the information provided. And again, in terms of drainage, no other drainage conditions are added because a suitable drainage strategy has been provided. The site sits in flood zone one as well, so uh, low risk of flooding. So overall, the site is recommended for approval subject to the signing of a section 106 agreement, which relates to the travel ban travel plan bond. So that's just ensuring that the um, targets set out in the submitted travel plan are achieved, as well as biodiversity net gain. So a lot of the biodiversity net gain will be provided on site. However, there's just a slightly small deficit which will be provided off site. And then just to conclude, the site sits in within a mixed used area, which is extremely well connected. The proposal will create grade eight office space aimed at startup businesses, as well as ancillary business space, which is aimed at sort of the useful local residents. It's a feature building, which has a modern design and situated on a key landmark site within the lakeside area. And there are no outstanding consultees objections. Thank you. Thank you for that, Jess. Uh, we now have Mr. Max Jones, the agent, who has re uh, requested to speak in support of the application. Uh, this is now your opportunity to address the committee for up to five minutes. When you're ready, press the large red button to start your submission. And when you finish, press it again to mute the microphone. And I'll let you know when you've got one minute remaining. Thank you. Firstly, we want to thank uh, the plan officers and colleagues, um, and we welcome their support for the plan application, which has been presented today. Uh, as a local architectural practice working with a family-run local developer, it's an exciting project um, to deliver a landmark building to Doncaster. As background, the developer acquired the land following a successful tender process with the council securing a plot earmarked for a mixed-use development. In alignment with Doncaster Council's vision, both the applicants and ourselves adhere to the guidelines which was outlined in the design brief for the plan application. Throughout the planning process, we worked with officers in addressing feedback from consultees, and this resulted in a reduction in the scale of the development and a commitment to preserving existing trees along the site boundary. The applicant envisions this development as a landmark building for Doncaster, a high quality grade A office space designed to attract businesses, facilitating the growth of existing enterprises while attracting new ones to the city. Post occupation, the applicant is eager to work closely with Doncaster Council and the Chamber uh, and contributing to the economic growth of our city. Should the Planning Committee grant approval, the applicant has secured the necessary funding and is poised to commence construction by the summer of 2024. Thank you. Thank you for your submission, Mr Jones. Would any of the Planning Committee like to ask a question? No? Okay. Okay. Um, committee members will be now go into the debate section. Would any of the members like to ask the planning case officer a question? Councillor Hoggart. Yeah, I just uh, it's shown on the map a lot of bus stops. Is there any buses? <coughs> <laughs> bus stops don't mean that there's buses running there. I, I should imagine there are, but. I mean, Lakeside is quite a well-connected area. Like I said, there's a lot, a lot of bus services up and down Borcher Road as well, buses around um, Lakeside. I'm not familiar with the exact timetable of bus services. I'm not going to admit that, but we've got Andean Highways here as well. I might be able to pick up that a bit more, but I think we can all say comfortably that Lakeside is well-connected in terms of bus services. Councillor Cox. I just, I just like to say, I like this application. It's just a shame it's not in the town centre. And, you know, again, we're pushing development away. But, yeah, I think it's great. Thank you. Councillor Stapleton. Thank you, Chair. I wasn't going to say anything, but in the interest of debate, I thought I'd better stick my two pen at him. Um, I think I've been banging on about this for a long time, that Doncaster desperately needs um, office premises for smaller businesses, for start-up businesses. And it's wonderful to see a development doing exactly that. 
that uh, it's not creating one of these 5,000 square foot empty buildings that we seem to have quite a few of in Doncaster. So I certainly welcome this development. Thank you. Do we have any other questions or comments? No. Therefore, is there a proposal to grant planning permission subject to conditions and the signings of section 106? Uh, that's been moved by Councillor Cox. Do we have a seconder? Councillor Hogarth, can we have a show of hands in favour, please? Therefore, planning has been granted. We now have application number four, which is planning application 23 oblique 01702 oblique COU, which is a change of use of ground floor from vacant bar, public house, uh, to an off licence, classy at former Exthorpe Star Bar, Two Langer Street in Exthorpe. Um, Susie Boyce, the planning case officer, will introduce this item. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Uh, so this application has been brought to committee because of significant public interest. Um, as the Chair has just introduced, the application seeks full planning permission for a change of use from a former bar, the Hexforp Star Bar, um, to an off-licence, and the recommendation is for approval. So just to introduce the site and its surrounding context, uh, it is a two-storey building, detached building, uh, in a residential area. Um, the main... Uh, Streets around, so Langer Street is where the main access is from, and then Glenfield Avenue um, on the other side as well. So it has frontages at both uh, at both streets. There's also a footpath link through to uh, the Patrick Sterling Court, um, that you can see there. Just a few photos of the site. Uh, here we have the Langer Street frontage, uh, Glenfield Avenue uh, frontage on the right there as well. Uh, so currently the building has three residential flats at the first floor. The ground floor uh, was formerly a bar. It's been vacant for several years. Um, a few more pictures. Uh, so, yeah, parking and servicing is to the rear. The parking spaces actually serve the residential flats above. Um, and then, yeah, there's also a side access at Langer Street there. Just a few photos of the surrounding area. Uh, here we have Langer Street, um, and here we have uh, Glenfield Avenue as well. So both these are from Google Street View from November 2022, so fairly recent. In terms of the actual proposal, um, this is the proposed layout for the ground floor, as we have about 150 square meters of floor space for the proposed off license and then storage uh, and toilets and staff facilities at the back there. Bin storage is to be in that rear yard that you saw the photo of. Deliveries will be from the rear by Glenfield Avenue as well. Um, the uh, agent has confirmed that will be via a small van, Ford Transit or similar. Um, and just to clarify that there are no external alterations that are being proposed. Uh, opening hours are to be 8 a.m. until 9 p.m. Um, and deliveries uh, are also going to be confined to Monday and Fridays, 10 to 11 a.m. In terms of the main considerations, uh, first of all, there's the principle of the change of use. Uh, policies 10, uh, which relates to residential policy area 20, uh, 22, um, um, which is about town centre uses, uh, and policy 51 in terms of loss of community facility are relevant here. Um, as a former public house, uh, the proposal um, would result in the loss of that community facility. However, the national planning policy framework also considers local convenience stores, such as an off-license, as a different type of community facility. So in that respect, there is no loss um, and the change of use is acceptable. Um, in terms of location of a retail unit outside of Doncaster City Centre or other retail or district centres, um, it's a small shop which is serving the local community um, and therefore it's acceptable against policies 10 and 22. Uh, other 
considerations, parking and highway impact, this has attracted um, a number of neighbouring objections, uh, concerns that customers parking for the shop um, will obstruct Langer Street. Um, so it is worth highlighting here that the current um, planning use of the site remains as a bar or a drinking establishment and actually the parking requirement for drinking establishment is higher than that for a non-food retail store. Um, so in, uh, in, in that respect, the parking requirement will be lower. As a convenience store off license, we would also expect most customers to walk um, rather than drive. Those who drive are unlikely to be parked for any significant period of time. The um, applicant has also provided uh, details of the types of delivery vehicles and confirmed that those will be from Glenfield Avenue to the rear, um, which uh, is generally um, less, uh, less parked up. Um, and then finally, neighbouring amenity. Um, there have been some concerns about uh, customers exiting the shop and um, potentially causing antisocial behaviour issues. Um, this isn't considered likely to be the case, um, particularly when you compare it to its current lawful planning use, which is as a bar, um, the amenity is likely to be improved in that respect. Um, so overall, uh, the principle of the change of use is considered acceptable, compliant with policy. Um, there will, the impact on parking and highways will be less um, than if the pub were to reopen. Uh, delivery and servicing arrangements um, have, have been found to be satisfactory and there's not considered to be any material harm to neighbouring amenity. Uh, and so the application is recommended for approval uh, with a number of conditions um, relating to opening hours and deliveries as well. Um, Thank you for that, Susie. Uh, we've got a Mr Richard Dahl, a member of the public, who was requested to speak in opposition to the application. Yeah, that one's fine, thank you. Uh, this is now your opportunity to address the committee for up to five minutes, so when you're ready to commence, if you press the large red button, and then again to mute the microphone when you're concluded, and I'll let you know when you've got one minute remaining. Thank you. Yeah, I've been asked to come and speak from 14 of the local residents. Um, I work in architecture myself, and there's a few concerns. Highways is one concern and antisocial behaviour is the other. Um, we start with the antisocial behaviour one. The road that Langer Lane is a dead end, and so is Glenfield, the dead end. And between them is a, a, an area which is a shared space for pedestrians and vehicles with a plant base, um, a planter, risen planter, which the concerns, and I can understand where they're coming from, is that for antisocial behaviour, it's ideal. You can do what you want in that corner and police can't get through because you can run past the bollards either way. So saying that there won't be any antisocial behaviour, for me, needs addressing because there's bound to be. There's always use outside shops, but if they know police can't get round, I think it's it needs some sort of looking at. I can understand where the residents are coming from. With regards to the transport element, um, if you look on Google Earth or anything like that, it shows that it's two dead ends and everybody's going to use this Langer Street where, I don't know if anybody, any of you have been out and looked, all right, it's a two lane, but one side of the road is all, is all houses with drop curbs to get onto their private parking with a turning head, and on the other side, it's just open for anybody to park, which on a night from three o'clock onwards, and I went this dinner time and the same there, there's always people parked there. So people are gonna go to the shop, like I would do, think I'll only be two minutes, drop my car in, turn in head, I'll drop my car at the other side, run in, get me vape or my pint cans, back out into the car, try to spin round, but you only need three cars down there and nobody will be spinning round. The other thing, to find that shop from Urban Road, there'll have to be some kind of sign. People are going to turn down there who don't really know the area if they're just driving along Urban Road. And there's going to be cars coming the opposite direction to get out. And because they'll all be both on the same 
side of the road so I think it will come to a lot of reversing back into um, urban road which urban road and this junction in we're talking about cars park on urban road right up to it causing the sight lines to be non-existent going forward never mind in reverse and the entrance to that Langer Street is so tight it's unbelievable the other one goes the other entrance going Glenfield goes straight past the school and you kind of have to weave your way around to get to it and so people aren't going to use that everybody will use Langer Street who go in a car obviously people walk but most people and um, nip out in car don't they everybody does it and I think it will be major concerns with the junction of Urban Road and Langer Street. I know that they say it were a pub before and you get one space per four square metres at a pub. But if you go in a pub, you don't go for two minutes and run out. And I think the problem is, is when you drop your car, run into the shop, come out, then all of a sudden you're blocked in and where do the, the other cars go because the seven houses that are across the road use the other side of the road as visitor parking even some of them park in front of their drives blocking their own car in which makes it even even thinner I just don't think cars will get in and out one minute remaining ok thank you um, so that's the points they've brought me here to say is they're worried about the highways and they're definitely worried about the antisocial behaviour, especially with the path that walks around, because people won't use that path if everybody's loitering around the garden type area that's already there. And and that's it. I think that it just highways wise, it needs a better look. You can't just back it, you can't just say, Oh, it were a pub before and the pub had no parking, so a shop doesn't need parking. It doesn't make any sense to me that and that's why I set, I put my hand up to come and stand with them else you'd have had 14 people with five minutes apiece thank you very much thank you for that Mr Hall do we have any committee members wishing to ask Mr Hall a question no uh, therefore we've got Mr Mabeen Patel on behalf of the applicant that is requested to speak in support of the application This is now your opportunity to address the committee for up to five minutes. If you press the large red button when you're ready to start your submission and again to mute it when you've completed and I'll let you know when you've got one minute remaining. Thank you, Chair, and good afternoon, councillors. I believe the starting point in the material planning consideration is the existing lawful use of the site as a pub. The existing pub is shut, however, it could open tomorrow without requiring, requiring planning approval. A new landlord could potentially attract younger clients or people from outside the local community. So the question is, would the proposed use as a shop be more harmful to the amenity of local residents and parking than the existing pub? In terms of a pub, this would operate late into the night, would potentially have audible music, customers would park for hours at a time, customers would congregate out around the entrance to have a cigarette and have a chat. This would also cause nuisance to surrounding residents. In stark um, contrast to pubs, the proposed shop would be small and sell groceries, toiletries, general food and drinks to the immediate surrounding residents. The opening hours would be 8am to 9pm, after which residents could enjoy a quiet night's sleep. Delivery times would be 10am to 11pm, one hour, when residents are awake and outside of the school runs. There would be no loud music and there would be no reason for customers to congregate and make noise outside the premises. Now, a number of concerns have been raised from the residents. I will deal with these categorically. With regards to the principal use of the site, this application would replace one community facility with another, as such there is no loss of a community facility. Local policy allows for small shops in residential areas. It would not be a large supermarket, and it would not compete with shops in Doncaster Centre, ensuring their vitality and viability. There is also one other shop in the surrounding area at 151 Urban Road, However, potential competition between individual businesses and the financial impact on ex existing businesses is not a material consideration. The fact that the area may already be served by a shop is not in itself a reason for refusing planning permission. Moving on to highways, um, the existing pub provides no parking. Similarly, no parking is provided for the shop. However, the proposed shop 
would have a reduced parking requirement in the local plan than that of the pub. There are no parking restrictions at Langer Street or on Glenfield Avenue. Customers would typically be in and out of the shop in less than five minutes. Whilst both of these highways have sufficient space for parking and turning heads for vehicles to manoeuvre and not use residents' drives. Also, the majority of customers would be local and choose to walk to the shop. The delivery vehicle, vehicle would be a small van. This would be smaller than what is used by the pubs for their deliveries. Therefore, the proposal would not detrimentally impact on the highway network or have a greater impact on the existing use. Um, a number of objections received relates to crime and antisocial behaviour. In terms of crime, South Yorkshire police have been consulted and raised no objections. In addition, the applicant would be installing around 30 CCTV cameras at the property, whilst the use itself would provide natural surveillance from staff and customers. Objectors also state that the sale of alcohol and cigarettes would impact negatively on the neighbourhood. Firstly, both these products are widely available in other shops. Secondly, um, alcohol would not be consumed on site. Customers would buy the product and take it home to enjoy. Similar could be said about smoking. Um, in terms of litter and antisocial behaviour, they've been mentioned as a negative impact. However, this is considered a social problem and of education um, if, you, if people aren't using bins. Um, there have been no external changes to the building itself. In terms of advertisement consent, this is um, this would be submitted in due course, um, that separate legislation. Um, to summarise, no objections have been raised from the council's policy officers, highway officers, or from South Yorkshire Police. This proposal would make use of an empty property and introduce a shop which serves the local community, including the elderly. The proposal would materially improve the impact of local immunity over the current lawful use of the premises as a pub. In my view, there is no justifiable reason to refuse this application. I'm in full agreement with the office's balanced judgment and recommendation of approval. The development means local and national planning policy. It is respectfully requested to this planning committee that planning permission be granted. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, councillors. Thank you, Mr. Patel. Would anybody like to ask a question? Right, so I'm going to start with uh, Councillor Hogarth and Councillor Cox and then Councillor Sokolou. Can you just clarify the uh, delivery days and times, please? Because it confuses. Yeah. It, it is to be um, uh, conditioned. The delivery times will be 10 a.m. to 11 a.m., so an hour in which deliveries will take place. What days? Monday and Friday. Monday and Friday, it's in your court. Yeah, I've said that, but it says Monday and Friday. And then later it says delivery will be 10 to 11. Not mentioning any dates in one of the conditions. And so it's just a, they don't uh, match. So can you clarify what days? It's a very good spot, Councillor Hogarth. The condition uh, we can come into this in questions for officers. It is in your gift if you don't think that condition is precise or specific enough to ensure that that is precise and specific and we'll be able to take advice from the officer who's been working with the applicant to ensure that it does satisfy all the needs but also the safeguard the uh, uh, residential immunity of the surrounding area that we've heard about today. Do you have a, another question, Councillor Hogarth? Yeah, so it is Monday and Friday, not Monday to Friday. Yes, that's correct, Monday and Friday. Councillor Cox. Thank you. I just wondered if you'd, you'd been to licensing yet, because a lot of the the things that you've, you've stated in your presentation would be things that would be, have to be addressed with licensing, not necessarily with planning. These are all planning considerations. Um, we have got an um, off-license license, license uh, now agreed with the applicant. Um, so the applicant has got an off-license with the council um, in place. Councillor Sokolo. I have uh, three questions. Um, first thing is uh, how long, how, I mean, how many years the pub haven't been operation? Speaking to the applicant, um, it's been around six 
months to a year. So six to well, six months, months to a year. To a year it's not been in opened. operation okay. yet. It's been shut. So, so it's vacant at the moment. Okay. So so what's the operation time before? You know, it is just a uh, whole day running the pub. I believe it was open until eleven p.m. Okay, I have another question uh, mentioned on this application. They have a flat above the pub. So how many flats in there? How many uh, tenants in there? There are three flats above the pub. So they are fully operation? They are, I believe, occupied at the moment, yes. So is, is it a two bedroom or one bedroom? They are two bedrooms, I believe. I think w two of them are two bedroom and one of them is one bedroom, but don't quote me on that. Okay, so that means at least about five people uh, above. Correct. So then that if people with the family, so they need three car parking there. Can I just add that? There is, there is parking to the rear of the property, which is being retained for those three flats. So there are three, three parking spaces to the back of the pub, which are being retained for the flats okay. at first floor level. Can okay. I just say that the, the access to the flats are not part of the planning application, so not in clear consideration uh, okay. regarding this application. Um, do we have any other questions? I have a last one, sorry. Um, is it this the small uh, supermarket you want to, to make, or is a half, a uh, pub, half supermarket? This will be a small convenience store for the local people. Um, it will not be a large supermarket competing with any of the shops in the town centre. Um, most of the residents um, would probably walk um, to to the store. So only the supermarket, small shop? It's no a small problem. shop off licence. Okay. Thank you. I, I think that's my question. Do we have any other questions? Thank you, Mr Patel, for your submission. Right, committee members, we're now going to go into debate. Do you wish to ask the any questions of the officer, uh, Councillor Stapleton? Thank you, Chair. I don't like to disappoint. Um, <coughs> I looked at this, and at first I was a bit sort of like unsure as to why it was even coming to us. Then, obviously, I'm looking at the, obviously the, ch the change of usage because the, the, the it's been presented as a off licence. Now, my idea with an off licence is a large building that's got shelves and shelves and shelves of alcohol because I used to own one. So exactly that say. The reality is this is a a small shop that has happened to go and get an alcohol license to sell alcohol as well. Um, but the, the the big thing I sort of I suppose trying to turn this into a question. We're talking about deliveries. Now, if we were talking about commercial vehicle deliveries, I would understand why a condition would be imposed. But as we've already heard from Mr. Patel, and I think he does mention in here, that deliveries of a what I would call a non-commercial type vehicle how can we impose a restriction when the owner of that vehicle is entitled to drive down that road park on that road and load his goods it's not a commercial vehicle so therefore i'm, I'm just sort of questioning really the the validity of put, imposing that condition if it was a condition regarding commercial vehicles i would get that i would understand that but this is somebody trying to earn a living in an economy that's not very good, they're investing money into this, and yet we're saying you, you, you're restricting when you can bring your little van in to, to bring your goods in, which is probably just coming from a local cash and carry. And yet, when you look at all the other shops all over the borough, most of these little shops exactly like this don't have those sort of restrictions. And I, I just think that that restriction there perhaps needs to be tweaked or even removed completely. So that's just my thoughts. Well, the officers are discussing uh, your uh, question. Uh, do we have any other questions that anybody would like to ask? Roy? Thanks, sir. Thank you, Chair. Uh, very good uh, issue raised there, Councillor Stapleton. It is in your gift as the Planning Committee to decide whether that condition fulfills a purpose that is necessary and reasonable. What you find here is that uh, officers have tried to work with the applicant. We've kind of got that agreed. If that condition does stay, I would urge com uh, committee members to say we need to tweak it along the lines that Councillor Hogarth has said to ensure it is absolutely specific. 
Uh, and what that condition was put on for was to try and respond positively to some of the concerns of the most nearby local residents. But you're quite right, it is a, deemed to be a small local facility. It's not going to be having lots and lots of deliveries, but it is a new application that is before the committee. And if it had been a new pub, we would have considered that as well and responded positively. So it is ultimately in your gift as to whether that condition should remain or not. And if it should remain, I would urge you to tweak it to ensure it saves Monday and Friday on it as well. Yeah, I, I understand the Monday, Friday, but I get, I get that. I just think that should, a restriction like that should relate to commercial vehicles, commercial vehicles only. So I'd like to recommend that we actually put in a caveat that it does not include non-commercial vehicles. Because the, the shop owner manager could be nipping out to the cash and carry in his Volvo estate and coming back with a few bits and bobs, but then he could find himself in hot water because it's, it, it, it's covered by this, this, this caveat there, this, this condition. I just think if it's a commercial vehicle, I understand that completely, but to curtail somebody's ability to trade and do his business, um, when we're talking about ordinary ordinary vehicles and, or small vans, which is non-commercial. And obviously that's determined by what the insurance is, isn't it? I mean, you know, I just think it should be non-commercial non vehicles should be allowed to come and bring his delivery. So his little van can go off to, to Booker's, or, or sorry, I'm not allowed to name any brands, but any other cash and carry that might be equally as good um, and go and pick up the stock. It, it's, it's not like we're talking large Z cages rolling off the back of an HGV. So I just think I'd like to sort of tweak that condition. Alice Dinkman, I'd comment at that, please, Councillor Stapleton. Thank you. Um, it is a, a query I had with the officers, and I was told that the applicant had actually offered the condition to limit it to such a limited time of Mondays and Fridays, 10 till 11. Um, and I did query whether that was a reasonable amount of time, but the applicant was happy to offer that um, in to um, ensure that the neighbours weren't being disturbed. I think it's difficult to enforce different types of vehicles coming in and out and I think it's uh, just better in terms of the condition if it just says deliveries um, rather than the types of vehicles. That's from my experience of enforcing such conditions um, but at, at the end of the day it's a matter for members and, and what you feel is appropriate. Thank you for that, Alison. Do we have any other questions? Yeah. Councillor Palmer. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I've got concerns with um, parking and highways, with it both um, being situated at a dead end. I, I would like to propose a site visit. Okay. The fair vote to be proposed for a site visit. Is there any other questions? No. Um, therefore, Councillor Palmer has uh, moved for a site visit. Is there a secondary for that application? Uh, that's been seconded by Councillor Beach. Uh, she's just yeah, yeah parking in the. She's turned around and said about the um, oh, turning yeah. around. Yeah. Okay. Can we show have the show bands any in favour of a site visit? Those against, and abstentions. Okay, therefore, this item has been deferred so that we can actually do a site visit. Thank you for that. <coughs> We're going to go on to application number five, which is planning application 22 oblique 02382 oblique OUT, which is an outline application for erection of one residential dwelling up to one and a half storeys on a vacant play area, approval being sought for access on an amended scheme at land of Sutton Road, Kurt Sandwell. And uh, Susie Boyce, the planning case officer, will present this application. So I'm pleased now Councillor Farmer has left uh, the <coughs> chamber as she has registered an interest. Right, we've just been requested for a toilet, uh, toilet break. Are members happy for us to have a five minute quick toilet break, please? So it is now 16.32, so 16.40, you've got eight minutes, so please be back on time. Okay, everybody, we're all back in the chamber. We're looking at application number five, uh, 22 will be 02382, 
OULT uh, application for erection of one residential dwelling up one and a half storeys in a vacant play area, um, approval being sought for access and amended scheme at Land of Sutton Road. So I'm going to hand it back to you now, Susie. Thank you, Chair. So this application has been brought to committee because it represents a departure from the development plan as well as because of public interest. So the application seeks outline planning permission with all matters reserved except for access uh, for the development of one residential dwelling of up to one and a half storey on a former playground on land off Sutton Road in Kirk Sandal. Uh, so just a bit of an introduction to the site. Uh, it's an un unusual wedge-shaped um, piece of land with a long, thin access there from Sutton Road. It's about 0.15 of a hectare, surrounded by residential properties on all sides. Um, so we've got two-storey properties at uh, Longton Road there, um, as well as bungalows at Tyndale Court, um, as well as... Harewood Avenue as well, those are two-storey properties. Uh, a few pictures of the application site, uh, so this is the interior of the site facing east, uh, those houses in the background there on the left picture are at Longton Drive, um, and then on the right hand side there you see properties at Harewood Avenue uh, to the south uh, southwest of the site. So the site formerly comprised uh, a playground, an open space. Um, the parish council, who are the owners of the site and the applicants, closed the playground in 2007, primarily due to surface water flooding issues, um, but also because the site experienced quite a lot of antisocial behaviour and vandalism due to its uh, secluded location, uh, which is quite set back from Sutton Road, as you can see in uh, these photos. So this is the site access um, they're both facing towards the entrance and then into the site. The entrance is uh, quite narrow, just 4.1 uh, metres wide. It actually decreases uh, even, even more to 3.9 metres at one point. This has meant that the scheme has been reduced since its original submission, which was for up to three dwellings, um, because the site access wasn't wide enough. It would have required passing places for vehicles um, so it's been reduced down to one, which doesn't require them. Just a few more photos. Um, so, uh, yes, this is the northeast corner of the site, and then there's the outside of the site access at Sutton Road. Uh, just a couple of pictures of uh, Sutton Road as well. So um, the picture on the left facing towards the site entrance there, and then the picture on the right facing away from the entrance. So the proposal is outline only, and um, this is an indicative site layout, uh, which has been, pr been provided showing how it can accommodate one dwelling. Um, the access is to be amended, uh, it, it, slight improvements are to be made to the access um, at Sutton Road there to facilitate the development. Um, yes, so the permission, the well, the proposal is for a dwelling of up to one and a half storey in height. Um, so the full detailed design will be a matter um, for the reserve matters stage, um, but any permission will make it clear that roof dormers uh, wouldn't be supported in order to prevent um, potential concerns about overlooking to neighbouring gardens. Uh, main considerations, uh, so first of all got the principle of the loss of the playground as open space. Uh, the site is designated as open space in the local plan. Uh, policy 27 and the MPPF, National Planning Policy Framework, protect against the loss of open spaces. Policy 27 Part D only allows loss to alternative uses where community support can be demonstrated through public consultation. Uh, when the application was submitted, um, there was not sufficient evidence to show uh, the necessary level of community consultation for alternative community uses at that point uh, and therefore the applicant subsequently undertook a six-week period of public consultation uh, seeking um, public opinion over potential alternative uses for the site. Uh, it's just a quick overview of the results of that consultation. Um, so the survey was posted to 60 homes on uh, adjacent streets. Uh, it was also advertised in various locations within the community. Um, 
in terms of results, uh, 15 surveys were completed. Uh, that represents about 0.17% of the parish. Um, a number of uses were indicated to be supported by local residents, including the play park, allotments, community garden, green space, uh, or a park for dog. Um, although only, there were only two volunteers um, to actually help make that happen. Uh, overall, it's been accepted that the, uh, the results don't indicate any overwhelming public support uh, for the retention uh, of the site as an alternative uh, uh, open space use. Just going back to the main considerations there, uh, access is the only matter of detail that's being considered. Um, there have been no objections from the highways officer, uh, or rather objections have been resolved uh, following minor amendments to the plans. Uh, in terms of drainage, this was one of the reasons the playground was, was closed in the first place. There are some surface water flooding issues and therefore our drainage officer has requested a condition ensuring that the freeboard level uh, is no less than 300 millimetres um, to ensure that that, uh, that is no issue. Um, in terms of ecology and trees, um, we've had no objections on that respect. Um, the ecology officer has requested a condition requiring an ecological enhancement plan to make sure that biodiversity net gain can be delivered at the reserve matters stage. So just to conclude, um, the recommendation is for approval of the outline uh, planning application subject to conditions. Uh, over, overall, it's considered there's no um, overwhelming public support for retention of the site as open space. Um, and therefore policy uh, 27 has been satisfied. It can be released for an alternative use. It's a suitable location for residential development. It's surrounded by housing on all sides. Um, the indicative layout indicates the site can easily accommodate one dwelling uh, without harming neighboring amenity. Um, satisfactory site access can be achieved and it's acceptable in all other respects. Uh, all other matters of detail will be uh, dealt with at the reserve matters application stage. Um, yes, I think that should be it. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Baxter. Before I invite Mr. Ian Mills to come down and speak, uh, based on the fact that we've got two representations and it's turned quarter to five, um, are we happy to move standing orders to make sure that we can continue and conclude the meeting and the agenda? Uh, can I have that move, please? Can you have it seconded? And shall that everyone in favour? Okay, thank you for that. Okay, so we've got Mr. Paul Daniels, a member of the public, has requested to speak in opposition to the application. Um, if you'd like, can you come down to the microphone? If you come down to the front. This is now your opportunity to address the committee for up to five minutes. When you're ready, if you press the large red button to start your submission, and again to mute it when you've concluded and I'll let you know when you've got one minute remaining. I am Paul Daniels and I am here to represent the residents of the length of Longton Road which runs parallel to the eastern side of the proposed development. We all know that there is a housing situation at the moment but this development or this dwelling would not solve the housing situation it would just be a mere drop in the ocean. There are some people living in Bambinon that believe that the residents around the area, it will, the development will not affect their lives. Well, I'm here today to tell them it will. Firstly, with the relaxation of the planning uh, permission legislation, the number of outbuildings that could be built on that site could be limitless. These could mean stables for housing horses. And with this, smells, odours and flies associated with such animals. With the prevailing winds being predominantly northwesterly, sorry, southwesterly or westerly, these smells and odours would be blown straight across and through Longton Road and also onto Grange Park. And flies, anyone bitten by a horsefly will know how painful this could be. And in some cases, it could prove fatal to anybody with an allergic reaction to these bites. 
Such outbuildings would also attract vermin, namely rats. Once rats get established, they are very difficult to get rid of. Secondly, we are a nation of dog lovers, and it will be more than likely that anyone living in that uh, dwelling will have dogs. And there is nothing more annoying than dogs barking day and night. This would lead to people living around the area seeking noise abatement orders through the council. This is how the lives of some of us around the plot, contrary to what the people live, think in Barnby Dunn, will be affected. I therefore urge the plan committee to take heed of what I have just said and come up with the only possible decision and that is to reject the application. Thank you. Thank you for your submission, Mr Daniels. Do we have any questions for Mr Daniels? No? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we've now got Councillor Gary Stapleton on behalf of the Parish Council or other applicants and has requested to speak in support of the application. This is now your opportunity to speak to the committee for five minutes. Please press the large red button when you want to start your submission and again to mute it and I'll let you know when you've got one minute remaining. Thank you, Chair. You're pleased to know. I doubt I'll be using the full five minutes. Um, I've been asked by the Parish Council to, represent, to come and talk to you about this. It's quite simple. The decision was made by the Parish Council uh, to make this application. The Parish Council is not an independent body. It represents the people of Barnby Dun and Kirk Sandal. Since the very beginning of this project, the Parish Council has worked very closely with Doncaster Council, getting pre-planning advice, following all the guidance, following all the rules, and it's done it all the way through exactly as it's supposed to have done. The work that the officers have done has been brilliant. Um, I don't think there's any sort of complaint from our side. The, we, we, we've understood where the limitations are and we've acted accordingly. Um, so I haven't got really much more to say otherwise that, that I do hate, hope that people will support the officer and you know, if it's concerned, address, address the officers with the concerns. But, I support it, the Parish Council support it, and following the consultation, so do the people in the, in the Kirk Sandal area. Thank you. Do we have any questions for Councillor Stapleton? No? Therefore, is there a proposal to grant outline planning permission with all matters reserved except for access subject to condition? Is there a move by application? <coughs> Apologies. Would you like to go into debate? Carried away. I think it's your silence, you know. Have we got any? Would, would you like to ask the officer any questions, Councillor Anderson, and then Councillor? Um, given the concerns raised about the potential of outbuildings to be permitted, permitted development rights, could you just outline sort of what scale and could possibly be on a site like this? What is possible in terms of outbuildings and the potential development? Um, yes, so permitted development rights, you, you can get a fair bit. You can get up to 50% of the site area. However, it is subject to certain restrictions about distance from site boundaries. Uh, so there would be some setback from neighbours' uh, shared boundaries there. And would things like a stables or a dog kennels or something of that nature require, fall under permitted development? Or would that require additional planning permission? If it's ancillary to the residential use of the house, it may fall under permitted development rights. I don't believe a stables would. <laughs> it, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting one, but uh, if you are looking to stable a horse on your land, then under certain kind of veterinary legislations and so on, you need a specific area of land to actually house that horse. I don't think, not an expert, but my advice would be that that probably wouldn't be a sufficient sized piece of land to do that but that is something that's outside of of planning uh, fully take your your point on on that councillor uh, and in extreme circumstances we can retain control over land 
uh, and uh, we can remove permitted development rights from from uh, any permission what that would mean then would be that should the applicant want to do something on that land that would be permitted development and that's been removed they would have to apply to the council for anything moving forwards on that land so that is something you could consider councillor hogar yeah on 7.4 regarding uh, the uh, widths of uh, access the fire's objective and it's sustained uh, how are we uh, going to get uh, around that So the um, paragraph that's referenced there is one of the earlier comments from our highways officer. Um, if you read further down the report to paragraph 7.7, .7, um, that is the final set of comments from the highway officer, just confirming that uh, there aren't any outstanding objections in that respect. We have also consulted South Yorkshire Fire and Rescue, um, and they've raised no objections uh, in that respect either. But it says there's not meet policy in terms of good design does not meet the standards within the South Yorkshire and the FYRDG and unfortunately cannot be supported. Yeah, but apologies, this is probably, uh, we've probably tried to give planning committee too much information here uh, and it may be a bit difficult to understand but what, what, what we've tried to do in this report from 7.4, th uh, we had concerns with it then in 7.5 we received a revised scheme those concerns were then sustained uh, and ultimately as Susie's just said we got to 7.7 .7, where it says following receipt of the re revised site plans revision C the officer has now checked everything and there are no concerns now so the objection originally with the, the South Yorkshire fire engine, etc., was based on an earlier plan, which has now been superseded, and highways are accept, uh, are okay with that. And as Susie's mentioned, South Yorkshire Fire and Rescue haven't got any concerns. And I've got Andy Wiltshire, the highways officer, here saying, let me come in. So I'll pass over to the highways officer. Uh, initially, it was for more than one dwelling. So then it becomes a private drive, hence why we couldn't support it in terms of the width and also access for a fire engine into the site. Now it's a single dwelling, it's a different matter, so um, certain things can be done in terms of building regulations, sprinklers, etc., that then cater for any distance, and it's the distance stated within the SYRDG that they couldn't meet uh, because the fire engine couldn't get down. So there are certain things that they can do now, uh, but the first plan had more than one dwelling hence why I didn't support it and then the subsequent subsequent revision means it is only a car that's needed to get down there and also they can do certain things with uh, like I said building regulations and uh, things like that in terms of fire suppression uh, hence why now I'm, I'm okay with it. Is that okay? So for, quite clear a fire engine can't get down there then? Not from the track United. Do we have any other questions or comments that anybody would like to make? Okay, I'll go back to what I said a few moments ago. Is there a proposal to grant outline planning permission with all matters reserved except for access subject to conditions? Is there a mover for the application? Well, I'll move it. Is there a seconder? Uh, seconded by Councillor Cock. And then we shall advance those in favour. Those against? Therefore, planning permission is being granted.
committee members, just to let you know, I'm going to hand the chair now to the vice chair, Councillor Sue Farmer, because I may have to leave during this part, and I wouldn't like to leave uh, mid-chair. So just in case. Whoops, there. Are we ready, guys? Yeah. Right. Um, item six, consideration of section 106 agreement following viability as uh, assessment for the residential development of Olston Row, Carcroft, 19 forward slash 01514 forward slash OUTM. Andrea uh, Subs is, uh, Suds, sorry. If <laughs> How do you pronounce your name? Suddies. Right. Andrea Suddies. Now I know your name. Right. Zena Planning Officer will introduce this report. Andrea. Thanks, Chair. This is um, a deed of variation uh, request um, seeking to amend the Section 106 legal agreement uh, for the development of housing at Alston Road at Carcroft. It was at committee last month and was the request was deferred um, from last committee to update on the education contribution and to allow a representative from education to attend planning committee. So this time we have Neil McAllister. He sat there with the glasses. There's no sign to say who he is, but that's who he is. <laughs> so it's a, a, a quick background and outline to the application. There was a uh, planning permission was granted in outline in December 2019. Decision was subject to legal agreement. The agreement sought to deliver obligations including 26% um, affordable housing as on-site built units, a commuted sum of £201,267 to provide 11 secondary school places at Outwood Academy, and 15% on-site public open space and a scheme for maintenance. So as an update on the education contribution, um, a revised Calculation has been provided. Education as, as advised, and I'm, I'm going to quote what they've advised. Based on the reduced number of dwellings, this along with post-COVID birth rate drop, a change to parental preference and removing any out-of-catchment children from calculations, there's enough space at both Carcroft Primary and Outward Academy to accommodate any children arriving from this development. Therefore, no education contribution would be required. So you've got the original officer delegation report um, attached as appendix one along with a copy of the section 106 agreement so this slide that's uh, now don't say that it's not working it's not working is it <laughs> i don't know yeah <laughs> not working. Have got a copy of your this is an issue we had before. Just try and explain it with words. <laughs> no, there's nothing in the report. So the site is in Carcroft near the junction between Askin Road and Carcroft Road so it's on the junction that leads up to um, the Asda so it's that signalised junction Oh, 
<laughs> so yeah, the site is near the junction between Askin Road and Carcroft Road. Um, there's also an aerial view of the site. It's currently very overgrown, um, scrubland, and subject to a lot of fly tipping. Um, the site photographs that I took end of last year, you can see how overgrown the site is. Um, it's become now with the fly tipping. And then look at the site when it was 2019, when the previous application was in. Since then, there's been um, a new site owner. They've submitted the reserve matters application. Um, the reserve matters application seeking approval of um, siting, appearance, landscaping. So the outline approval was just merely for access. So they also submitted this deed of variation request as well to run concurrently. The scheme that they're currently looking to get the approval for, the reserve matters, was originally 73 dwellings, but it's been reduced to 63. So they've submitted a viability appraisal. That's been sent off to the council's independent external consultant. Um, they've appraised the scheme using the nationally accepted profit level of 17.5% um, on gross development value which is taken to represent a reasonable return for a development uh, such as this. It's been widely accepted at appeal. Um, national planning guidance advises on, on between 15 and 20% profit sales. The conclusion of the assessment shows the scheme with the policy compliant amount of, amount of affordable housing and education contribution would make this scheme unviable. So the section 10 groups Section 106 agreement, the variation would remove the requirement to deliver the affordable housing and there's no longer any requirement to provide any education contribution as there's capacity at other schools. So in terms of what would be the benefits of agreeing this, well it would bring back into use a currently overgrown brownfield site that's subject to frequent fly tipping as you can see on the site photographs. It would provide much needed new housing with a range of predominantly one, two and three bedroom properties in an area where the nearest allocated housing site is Skello. Um, so there's no other provision more locally. This means we'd be reliant on windfall sites such as this to provide any sort of meaningful housing. Um, officer recommendation is to agree the deed of variation to vary the terms of the legal agreement and to remove the requirement to provide affordable housing and the commuted sum in lieu of education. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Andrea. Does any member wish to speak on this item? Duncan? Uh, it's sort of no longer relevant to this one, but it's an important thing going forward. So I can ask now, or you can come back to me after we've made a decision if you don't want to sort of muddy the waters. Whatever you prefer, Chair. If you want to ask the question now. Right. Um, when this came last time, I asked the question, if we do away with the education contribution, who then picks up the tab for the places? Now, obviously, in this case, that's no longer a relevant issue because they decided they don't need any places, but nobody knew what the answer was at the time. So is it the local authority? Is it the school? Is it the Department of Education? Do we have an answer to that question now? Uh, so uh, good afternoon. Uh, Neil McAllister representing uh, children and young people. Um, so you're right in this case, we do have sufficient places so there's no contribution to make. Uh, going forwards, we always are a, a consultee so we always do our assessment and where we find that we have a deficiency of places, then we would ask for that 106 agreement. Uh, there have been occasions where there have been reassessments and the, that provision hasn't come forward. Uh, so in cases such as that, it is up to the local authority to ensure we have a sufficient supply of school places. Uh, the local authority has a, a small amount of capital funding that's uh, allocated to us by the Department for Education. Um, we use that on top of any Section 106 agreements that we do receive, and we would use our own funding in that way. Wherever it's a significant development, um, such as would create a new school, then we're at the uh, will of the Department for Education to provide that additional funding. 
but for small scale development, then we would look to provide it from our own resources. Thanks for that. Thanks for indulging me, Chair. Councillor Beach. Yes, just for clarity for, for people who perhaps don't know the area at all. Um, it was mentioned that the nearest uh, ha other housing sites are Skeller, and um, they are two, well, a large site cut into two. It's a good way away. It's not somewhere you would want to walk. Uh, at the moment, and I do say at the moment because they're under review, uh, there is a bus every hour. So, And your only shopping place is um, nearby, is Asda. Asda is well within walking distance, bearing in mind you're carrying heavy bags back again. Um, so it's a site, I think, that is needed for people who uh, don't have access to a car. Maybe maybe they have a car, but the, the partner goes off in the, the daytime, in it, and they're, they're, they're stuck to you know, go get into the store. So I would say that uh, the site really does need building in that area. Uh, it's a crappy site, <laughs> to say the least. And I think it would make life better for the people living round about. Um, you know, fly tipping, people going up there and in the dead of night, dumping heaven knows what. Uh, I think it would make life better for them. So I, I would su suggest that we, we, you know, accept this deed of variation. Thank you. So any more members? No? Right. Is there a proposal to authorise the Head of Planning to agree a deed of variation to vary the terms of the Section 106 agreement dated 13th of December 2019 to remove the requirement to provide affordable housing and to remove the requirement for a commuter's sum in lieu of education in accordance with the terms of the report? The provision relating to uh, public open space are unchanged. Is there a mover for this recommendation? Is there a seconder? Thank you, Gary Stapleton. Proposer, Iris Beach, seconded by Gary Stapleton. Thank you. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I will move to the vote. Please indicate four by raising your hand. That's unanimous. Thank you. That's four. Right, item seven, is it? And moving on to item seven, appeal decisions. The report is for information only. Does any member wish to speak on this item? Um, it's just on the um, caravan one, which is, um, well, appeals t two and three. Um, it says uh, enforcement stroke this this stroke upheld uh, is that just because it's subject to a change of um, of the the wording that's listed in the actual report? Oh, sorry, sorry, I didn't get that question. Is the um, yeah the um, must the Bethel House must Road yeah. the enforcement notice? It said it's uh, partly upheld. Is that because they want the, ch the wording changed? I think it's on. Um, let's have a look. I marked it once. Ah, there it is. Uh, on page 347, um, it says formal decisions. The enforcement notice is corrected by, and that's the reason for it, is it? Yeah, just looking at that. Uh concluding kind of section on mm. page five it talks yeah. about there is some changes to the words and also a time scale uh, for compliance to comply yeah. with the enforcement notice uh, so it was sub subject to that correction yeah. and change. variation so it's got appeal five months. Is dismissed <laughs> and enforcement notice is upheld it's probably one for me to probably look into in a little bit more yeah. detail yeah. Okay. and uh, I can explain that, that to your councillor yeah because yeah. it's going to come up um, well it's going to come up again uh, in you know, uh, town council and, and uh, various other <laughs> places because it's been a, particularly um, site house council it's been a bone of contention <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll endeavour to explain that to you by the end of the week oh that's, that's all right <laughs> thank you, you that's all does that five months start from the date of the decision yes 
Yes, it, yes, it does count. Yes. So one month gone. <laughs> yeah. Good. Right. <clears throat> Any more um, from the members? No. Can I ask the committee members to move that re the report is to be noted? Noted. Uh, noted. Agreed. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the business of today <coughs> meeting. I would like to thank everyone for their attendance and input. Now I declare the meeting closed. Thank you. Oh, right, well, oh, here's the missing back page. Oh, <laughs> Fell off.